This month's Readers and Writers Book Club monthly meeting will include a conversation with author Rich Ritter, the new voice of the American West. In addition to getting to better know Rich, we'll discuss his tryout video for professional basketball. Greetings, I'm Evan Swenson. I'm an author and a book publisher. I'm also a member of Author Masterminds, sponsors of Readers and Writers Book Club. Welcome to Readers and Writers Book Club. This is the worldwide online general membership meeting of Readers and Writers Book Club, rapidly becoming the book club destination for all readers of good books. Thanks for being here. Today's membership is represented online by author mastermind members and other book club members participating on Facebook Live. I hope you'll find every reader is a friend and every author is approachable. Once again, welcome to Readers and Writers Book Club. Of course, we'll be conversing about books, authors, writing, and the magic and miracle of reading. Okay, let's meet today's co-hosts. Mary Ann Paul is there co-hosting along with uh, Steve Levi and Victoria. Uh, Townsend is available. Uh, we are grateful that you're here today. And we're going to be talking with uh, Rich Ritter today. Rich is an uh, author, mastermind member. Rich is the uh, new voice of the American West. Rich, welcome to Readers and Writers Book Club. We're grateful that you're here. And, and in costume. <laughs> so uh, introduce yourself, Rich, and uh, tell us where you are, what you are, and a little bit about yourself. Well, I, um, I'm, I live in Juneau, and I'm sitting in the solarium of my house. It's raining outside, and a storm is rolling in. So if you hear the halyard on the flag whip around a few times, that's what that sound is. Um, I've lived in Alaska since 1976, grew up in Southern California, born in Iowa. So, but you didn't come to, you didn't go to Juneau as the art community of Alaska to write. No, I, I actually spent nearly 42 years of my life as an architect or a career in architecture. Um, and so I didn't, uh, uh, although I've always had an interest in writing, I didn't really start doing it seriously until I was 49. I just want to mention, uh, Rich, as we talk, we have Marianne and uh, Steve Levi here in Victoria. Uh, any of you author, fellow author, mastermind members, if you have questions you'd like to ask uh, Rich, if something comes up, jump right in and uh, let's get to know Rick, uh, Rich a little bit better. We already know him a lot better uh, than we did just by the way that he came dressed today. <laughs> That's uh, different, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So just jump right in and uh, at any time. So, but you spent 40 years then, Rich, in Juno as an architect. Uh, actually, yes. I um, actually became a registered architect in the state of Alaska. In 1979, I graduated from uh, Cal, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in California uh, in 75. And so my entire career as an architect has been in Juneau, Alaska. And uh, because of that, I have been on too many small planes traveling to Bush communities. Uh, and uh, after about 200 flights, I began to wonder if my if my luck was running out after a few narrow narrow calls. Yeah, that's the part of, that's what uh, small planes in Alaska does for you. Is, uh, yeah, yeah. But isn't that exciting, Rich? What's the most uh, fearful time that you ever was on a small plane? Tell us about that time. Oh, yeah. Our, our office had a had a high school project and Craig on Prince of Wales Island. And uh, um, my partner and I used to fight about who got to go there because we thought it was romantic. But after 
each of us went once, we tried to make the other one go. <laughs> so you fly, they have to fly the Red Eye Express and the catch a can. We're losing your uh, uh, stuff. Five in the morning, and then you take a plane to Craig and plane back there. And go ahead to, can you hear me now? We can hear you, but uh, you're, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Can, am, I, uh, am I coming through now, clearly? Yeah. Okay. It just comes and goes, so just keep talking, and okay. we'll make All it. All right. Well, I, I had a flight back from Craig uh, during a site visit during construction, and uh, uh, the pilot was, uh, um, we started to run into some clouds, and he started lowering, going lower and lower until we got between uh, mountains on both sides, and then we whited out. And uh, he actually did an evasive maneuver. He suddenly went up and turned sharply. And um, uh, I frankly didn't see a thing for about 30 seconds. And I kept on wondering if we were going to just pile into a mountain. So that's probably the most harrowing. And uh, I, I knew I wasn't alone when we got back to Ketchikan. The pilot was shaking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been in Southeast in a small plane, Rich. I know exactly what you're talking about. So yeah. what's Juno like, Rich? Uh, Juno is very interesting. It's a community of around 32,000, but because it's the state capital, uh, it has amenities that you really wouldn't find down South until you were in a town of probably 100,000. So we have, uh, we have the highest lawyer to population ratio in the country, I think, because the capital's here. Um, and we have uh, a lot of box stores and other amenities uh, that you wouldn't find in, uh, until you went to a larger community. So that's uh, the thing about Juno, though, is we average around 60 sunny days a year, plus or minus. And um, um, right now it's raining. Uh, they're predicting a, a rainy, dark summer, and they're mostly right, but we'll see what happens. Uh, tell us about uh, this video, Rich. That's, uh, that's a view from the downtown dock, uh, swirling around, looking at Gas Snow Channel. I see uh, two cruise ships in town. We haven't had any cruise ships for about a year because of the COVID pandemic. But prior to that, we had as many as five or six cruise ships in town at the same time. And there would be anywhere from three to 5,000 people downtown. So I, my last job was as the uh, chief architect for the city of Juneau. That was after 30 years in the private sector. And uh, my office was downtown when I would go home to work when there were that many cruise ships. It was a gauntlet to just walk half a mile from the office to the parking garage where my car was. And interestingly, uh, tourists thought Juno was, uh, was Disneyland because they used to walk out into the street to take photographs of each other and block traffic. <laughs> they, they thought it was a walking street. <laughs> so uh, uh, Steve and Victoria, Marianne, uh, have you have you got a question that you would burning to ask uh, Rich? Uh, yeah, why the West? You lived in Juneau. You're right smack dab in the center of the Alaska Gold Rush, one of the cities that made the Alaska Gold Rush, and you're writing about the West. That's not the West. It's the North. Why the West? <laughs> it's the it's the West of the North. <laughs> yeah, but every time I try to say. Oh, that, well, I grew up. I grew up in Southern California. I came up to Alaska when I was about 20, 25, um, and my wife's first-year roommate lived in Caldwell, Idaho, and had a cabin in Silver City, Idaho. And we have made five or six trips there over the years. Um, and uh, so I have a fascination with that area, and also with the history of Southern California, and. Uh, uh, a lot of influences about uh, Western movies, Western writing, and uh, and so that that's what started it. My my first novel was not about the West. It was actually about an adopted son who did not believe he was worthy of love. And uh, the climax of the novel takes place at the Chosin Reservoir during the Korean War. 
where the adopted son has his epiphany about whether or not he is loved. Um, but from, from there, I went to the heart of Abigail, which is about the gold history of Juno. And then from there, I went to, uh, I'm going to write a Western novel. So uh, I, I think I was partly inspired by Lonesome Dove, uh, The Virginian, books like that. And I've watched a lot of Western movies, although they made almost 5,000 of them. So I haven't watched all of them. But, uh, uh, and so that, that, was the, that was the start of it. So talk to us about uh, this book, Rich. Yeah, that was, that was the first novel. That was the story of the adopted son who does not believe he's worthy of love. Uh, I actually had, had, had an interest in writing all my life, but because of my career in architecture, I, I, I set that aside more or less. And uh, we have two adopted sons and they're frankly both a handful we, uh, we learned what adoption issues are all about. And so we ended up sending them to a special school. Um, and as part of that school, we had to attend seminars. And so during one of the seminars, we did an exercise. We were supposed to go through a series of exercises during the day. And then um, at night, you're supposed to put a pad of paper and a pencil next to your bed. And the next morning, you were supposed to write the first thing that came to mine, and that was theoretically your true purpose in life. And I wrote down author when I woke up. So I was 45 at the time, and then five years later, I, I uh, four years later, I um, published Toil Under the Sun. Toil Under the Sun is from Ecclesiastes, of course, and uh, the book is Im imbued with several passages of Ecclesiastes that are relevant to the storyline. But uh, that, that, that doesn't have any, a lot to do with the West, uh, other than uh, Western Juno. <laughs> no, it, it actually takes place in Oregon and, uh, and Korea. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, that's sort of West of here. But did you ever, <laughs> did you ever read the, oh, the Zane Grey classics? Yes, I, uh, I read um, Writers of the Purple Sage. Right, that's. Well, that's only well, one. <laughs> I've, I've only read about five or six Western books, actually. I, I, um, I, I've watched a lot of movies. I've done a lot of research. Um, and, uh, but uh, I don't have a huge reading list of Western novels. But I've read some of the real classics. The Virginian, the very first novel that is considered the, to have established the Western genre by Owen Owen uh, Pister, and then the uh, uh, Lonesome Dove. I read that. Uh, my, my son actually read all four, and he said, well, Lonesome Dove was the best. You probably don't need to read the others, so maybe I will someday. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Heart of Abigail. Well, that came about, uh, interestingly, after uh, Toil Under the Sun is 133,000 words and took five years to write, and I was about to embark on another big novel project and my wife said, why don't you write something shorter and funner? <laughs> and so I, I came up and then I said, like what? And she said, I don't know, how about Juno's gold mining history? And so the book is a combination of nonfiction and fiction um, and uh, it took, took less than a year to write, but my speed of writing didn't increase, it's just a shorter book. And then I illustrated the book with historic photographs from uh, the Alaska State Museum and the University of Alaska. So each chapter also has a poem at the beginning, uh, the chapter, and there's always a photograph. And so that was, uh, that was my shorter and funner project. So uh, that sounds like that, that that would be a book that uh, Steve Levi would be interested in. Uh, Steve, have you seen uh, that book? Uh, oh, yeah, I have, but anytime, anytime that you can mix um, authentic background and particularly photographs because the photographs photographs are really capture the moment and it's easy to go ahead and write about what a street in Juno was like during the gold rush but the minute you look at a photograph you go oh okay well you know what I wrote isn't exactly the way that it was but the big problem is especially in literature we got this Hollywoodization of all of the past and every time you pick up like a Westerns, for instance, you know, after a while of reading Louis L'Amour, they all sound the same. 
you know, and you're saying, well, that's wild. It's because I did the California gold rush for a long time and I read the papers and found out all kinds of interesting little stories and tidbits that nobody had ever done. So those pictures are incredibly important because they really give you, they really give you an, an, an eagle's eye look at, you know, at the moment. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned Louis L'Amour sounding the same. I, I discovered that too. I read several of his, um, but during the uh, research for the, the trilogy, you know, where things become a trilogy of the American West, I probably spent about a month researching dime and nickel novels. And I found uh, an archive at the University of Chicago, I believe. They had, they had archived tens of thousands of them. And after I was into it for about two or three weeks, I realized that some of these authors were cranking out a hundred page dime novel a week. <laughs> and, uh, and I talk about the same storyline over and over again. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, uh, interestingly, a lot of the Hollywood stuff comes from those dime novels. Uh, a lot of the fancy shooting and, and the idea of fast draws and things. Uh, uh, so I think the screenwriters that were producing the early uh, Western movies were probably heavily reading dive novels. Well, but, you know, that's what Hollywood is. Hollywood is the repetition of the same, you know, like they keep making the same movie over and over again. They just change the time period and the people. And, you know, instead of using John Wayne, they're using somebody currently around. I mean, North to Alaska, North to Alaska has been made seven times. So, oh, yeah. What happens is, you know, and I'm sure that they're just about getting ready to make it again, you know. Well, that, there's all, I don't <laughs> know how many that. movies they've made about Wyatt Earp and the gunfight at the OK Corral, but it must be 11 or 12. <laughs> well, they, they had a lot, you know, when, when they started the, the Western series on TV. And, you know, one, I, one little tidbit I picked up from Bonanza is they never changed the costumes. So oh. they were always wearing the same clothes. So they could use old stock footage to cram it into the TV show, you know, where they needed it. So they didn't have to keep the actors standing there doing the thing again. And they just never changed their clothes. So they could just slide in this old stock footage in there. Oh, yeah. But that was pretty funny, you know, because how many seasons did they do? They never changed their jeans. Can you believe it? <laughs> I, think I think you're right now that I think about it. Uh -huh. But the, yeah, Hollywood actually has, uh, with a few exceptions, I think the movie Unforgiven is probably one of the more authentic uh, efforts to, to portray the West. Right. Um, and there, there have been a few others, um, but in general, they're, they're uh, pretty off the mark. I remember watching some... Um, YouTube videos by the guy who came up with the whole quick draw thing. And when you see, when you watch High Noon or some other show where the, uh, when the person is quick drawing, they actually, uh, he developed a special holster that was lined with metal so that the gun could be removed. And it was, it was, uh, and the gun itself was modified. And then they practiced, practiced, practiced until they could do it. In fact, uh, in the Wild West, the holsters had to, uh, hold the gun firmly so it didn't pop out while you were riding across the plains. Yeah. So that whole, whole that whole notion of a metal lined holster and quick drawing was was uh, fraudulent. Well, there's only been one authentic authenticated drawing, you know, and shootout on the street. Only one, you know, and that's Wild Bill Hickok, you know. And yeah. since then, it's everybody, every Western has got the shootout. Right. And if you studied Billy the Kid, I think he shot everyone in the back with a rifle. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, Billy the Kid was supposed to have killed 21 people. They even only find that he might have shot four, maybe. You know, so yeah. I mean, the myth is built. And he died at, what, 21 or something? Right. Well, uh, Rich, um, uh, who is your favorite Western character, um, male or female? Oh, interesting. Your research, you found somebody that was, uh, you know, your favorite. Well, I, I especially like uh, Captain Call on uh, in Lonesome Dove. Um, and but as far as a female, you know, that's a tough one. The 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 Western novels, actually, the 
the, the woman in uh, Writers of the Purple Sage, who the story revolves around, was, was very interesting, and I can't recall her name. Um, um, but that's probably my favorite. I, I've read the book, I've watched uh, the TV show and all of the follow-ups. And uh, so Captain, uh, Captain Call is probably my favorite. So what about the real character? These are fictitious characters. What about the real, in your research, uh, who's a character that you've found that, uh, that you really liked? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure like is the right word. I, I found, uh, uh, if you look at the, if you look at Jesse James and his, his group, his gang, you know, it's actually, he's very complicated. There's, um, uh, he fought with uh, a guerrilla group during the Civil War and they came out of that into a, into a period that was chaotic and out of control. Um, they actually became folk heroes, very similar to, to other, other types of criminals later in, the, in, in our history. Uh, of course, he was, he was uh, murdered, uh, hanging a picture in his home. Um, uh, so I, fi I find characters like that, I'm not sure I like is the right word, but I find them extremely fascinating. And you can see parallels with, with um, like Bonnie and Clyde and, and uh, in later years, uh, America seems to have a taste for uh, making, I guess you would call them criminals, uh, heroes, if they believe they're fighting for the small guy. And so um, someone like uh, Jesse James uh, was, uh, was actually more complex than just someone who robbed banks. Well, so then uh, let's, talk, let's talk about this book. Uh, do you have anyone in this book that, uh, that you wrote, this part one of the trilogy, uh, uh, any character from the history that you weave into here? Actually, I weave in a few real characters. I, I, uh, General Tecumseh Sherman appears in the fourth chapter. Uh, I should say that there are seven, seven primary characters in the trilogy, and the first seven chapter chapter introduce them one at a time, and the fourth chapter introduces a fictitious carrier, character named Joshua Hota, whose father was an Englishman who came over to shoot buffalo, and his mother was was a Sioux Indian, and so he's half Sioux, half English, and uh, he becomes. Uh, uh, an Indian scout for the U.S. Cavalry. And uh, in that particular chapter, he's attached to a unit that's supposed to deliver a message to, uh, to the uh, forks of the Republican River to, uh, to General Custer. And Tecumseh Sherman, Sherman is at the, which group actually he was there, but at the fort. And he, he directs a former Southern officer who's now in the U.S. Army to deliver the message. And he has some serious problems with with uh, Joshua Hota. Of course, the storyline is over the course of the trilogy, they become uh, good friends. Now, so that's one example. But, but, but now you based him on a real character, though. Uh, Joshua Hota? Uh -huh. uh, no. Well, okay, you All created it. Are completely fictitious, uh -huh. uh, but they are. I did research on Indian scouts, for example, and buffalo hunters and the Sioux Indians, and so you could you could argue that he's he's based on on a melding of a, a number of different images that I had in my mind, uh, trying to imagine what he might have been like. And so um, uh, when I do the research, that's, and I think Steve Le Levi is is probably the same. Uh, my research was on actual living people, like photographs primarily, historical uh, recollections, and. And that inspired, uh, ultimately inspired the character. Rich, so where uh, do you do your research? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Victoria. Where, what do you use for your research? Do you use books, the internet, both? You know, I very little, very little books these days. I use primarily the internet, and so I might. You probably all know this. I I'm careful to get uh, at least two other confirmations that the information is accurate. 
if, if I'm relying on that as, for some purpose. Um, but I mostly use historical photographs. And so when I was, uh, uh, when I was studying each character and who they might be and what they might be like, I relied heavily on historical photographs from universities, um, news, uh, historical societies, things like that. And I usually found at least one, maybe as many as five or six that I would put together and that would provide my, my um, uh, influence for how I would develop the character. For example, the, uh, the primary character in the first chapter, uh, Gordania Sinclair is the daughter of a lighthouse keeper at Dunnett Head Lighthouse in Scotland. And her parents send her to, the, to America because things are so bad in Scotland in 1865. And uh, I actually found a photograph of a woman standing next to a next, uh, next to a gold mining tunnel, and just her pose, her body language, her appearance became a heavy influence on what Gordania was like. For example, and so I think I think Steve Levi might be similar. He probably uses a lot of historic photographs to influence his work. So that was the primary source. Then I would also find archives, uh, writings, for example. Uh, in uh, later in the first book of the trilogy, I, I track uh, a stage coast, coach ride from Kelton to, to Boise City. And amazingly, I found uh, an article from the Idaho Historical Society that, that tracked every single stop, what it was like, um, how long it took, how they changed the horses, and so I lied heavily on that to uh, of course, I, I fictionalize some things. I'm not just regurgitating the history. So the, the route was correct, the timing was correct, but then what happens at the stops when they stop for coffee and whatever else they have to feed them is completely fictitious. It's all all uh, all made up. Now that's this book? Uh, yes, that's the first book. That's the first book. That, that, that book uh, begins the the journey of the first of the primary seven characters as they make their way to Silver City, Idaho, around 1865 to 1868. But I also use, uh, I don't know how you do this, but I use um, uh, the uh, uh, Google Maps. In chapter five, the primary character is Songor Toth, who is a law student in Budapest. And uh, the, the chapter opens up with him walking uh, uh, from downtown or walking across the Budapest Bridge downtown to a restaurant to have, have a, a beer with his friend. And I realized that nothing has changed since 1868. And so I, I was able to follow the entire path with Google Maps because they had tracked it, they had filmed it, and I was able to describe um, certain key features of the walk. Uh, and it's all historically accurate. Of course, I'm not just trying to do a travel log. I'm trying to capture the essence of, of his environment. And so I don't go on and on about what a chain looks like or what the bridge looks like, but I provide enough. But that little walk uh, um, was inspired by Google Maps. Same thing with Dunnett Head Lighthouse. Amazingly, Google had driven out to Dunnett Head Lighthouse and so I could see what the lighthouse looked completely. And then I found um, a drawing of the lighthouse from 1860 and nothing, hardly anything had changed. <laughs> and so I was able to use the Google view with confidence that that's how it looked like in 1865. With a few exceptions of some additions provided by the British Navy during World War II, everything else that remained unchanged. Have you ever actually visited some of your locations in the West? Pardon? What's that? Have you ever actually visited some of your locations in the West? Yes, actually, the, I, I visited uh, Silver City, Idaho at least five times and stayed there uh -huh. uh, up to a week several times. Our, our friend Vaughn, who lives in Caldwell, a retired principal, elementary school principal, she bought um, a rundown cabin there, and then she has restored it over the last 20 years, and now it's hardly a cabin with propane heat and electric lights and things. Uh, right. <laughs> so we have, we have stayed there. I've actually done a book signing there in Silver City, and so uh, I know the area very well. I think that 
that probably helps with your authenticity. That probably helps with your authenticity when you write. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I, took, I took extensive, extensive photographs and I actually also took compass readings because um, I'm anal. And uh, uh, there are still some buildings that occur in the story. There's enough of them there. Uh, plus, I actually, I met a woman there who was, uh, she lives in, um, and she lives in, uh, I think, Nampa. But she wrote a book. Uh, it was an historical book about Silver City. And when we were there one time, I was, we were just walking around. And I walked into the general store. And she was standing there. And my friend Vaughn was with me. And she said, oh, you should meet. You know, and I can't remember her name. I apologize. And I said, you should meet. She wrote a historic book. So I, I, I said, well, gee, can I buy you one? And so she grabbed it off the shelf right there in the general store and signed it for me. And it, it was a tremendous resource uh, with all the background of, of, the, of, the, um, uh, of the town since the beginning. I found a second book by another author who I've not met, also a woman historian. And then uh, there were two or three other books that I was able to lay my hands on mm -hmm. that provided excellent information. Of course, you, you probably all know this. You, as I said before, it's not a, it's not a historian's book. It's a, it's a novel. So the information I use uh, keeps it authentic, but I use it in a manner that provides imagery, authenticity, um, a perspective for the reader, but I don't wanna bore them to tears with the description of a mine. Um, but if I have a, a nice description and a photo, I can grab some essence as it were and, and give them enough information so they can create their own images of what it might look like. I know you all do this, so. I shouldn't be telling you all this, but anyway. Rich, uh, you uh, uh, have a costume on today that's usually different. It's different than when we usually see you. Uh, explain the reason that you're here formally, and then you've inspired or transpired or expired or something hired uh, Steve Levi to, uh, Kind of go along too. You you hardly recognize you two uh, <laughs> authors. Uh, tell us about this. What's the? How come the costume? Different. Well, my, my old lumpy sweater is in the wash, Evan. I. <laughs> that's not the reason. Sorry. Um, actually, at the last meeting, uh, your lovely wife, uh, when we discussed the fact that I uh, played in the Juno Symphony, uh, she yelled out, "Where are your tux?" <laughs> And so I took her up on it. So, I, so this is a picture of uh, you at the, is that right? Yeah, it was taken about five years ago during a performance of the Palms Requiem. And uh, so it, there's a large chorus, which you can see behind me. Uh, and there's timpani and that's it. So I was the only percussionist on stage. So the chorus was there supporting you as the uh, percussionist. Oh. Uh, I think it's the other way around, Evan. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is the costume you, you wore today. So, <laughs> yeah. so here's a, a question that uh, come up. Uh, the questions I have, by the way, Rich, uh, I don't know how come Lois is fascinated by your story, but she keeps handing me these questions. So okay. she's, here's the question. She says, do you have any characters in your books that play music like you do? Actually, yes. Uh, in the second book, um, uh, a character uh, uh, appears. She works at a saloon slash brothel in downtown Silver City. Uh, her name is Nadia. She's from Russia. She came to the U.S. to teach school, uh, but unfortunately, she was she was raped. Uh, before she could even get started. And then because of that, she was shunned by the community. And she ended up surviving in Silver City the best she could. And she plays the accordion. And so the one of the other characters, who is a Lutheran pastor, uh, uh, Manfred Herman, uh, connects with her. And she agrees to play the music for, his, for the singing of the hymns in their services, which they hold in the back room of the saloon. And so uh, that's one character. You know, I, I'm not really a big fan of accordions. Uh, you've, probably, you've probably heard the joke, 
what do you call the perfect shot? It's when you throw the banjo in the dumpster and hit the accordion right in the keys. <laughs> but uh, but I, I do love I do love that uh, sort of gypsy, folksy Russian sound with uh, balalaikas and violins and accordions, which is unique. And so uh, there, there are no percussionists in the, in the work, sorry. <laughs> you didn't write about what you knew most about then. I didn't, no. <laughs> but I, I should mention uh, before I asked, I actually uh, started in percussion. My parents put me into a special program in the fourth grade. Uh, they had these release programs in Anaheim, California. And so they picked me up in a bus with other students once a week, take us to a, a, another area. And so I, I, they put me into a percussion class. And that was, I chose that myself because my uncle was a jazz drummer with a group in Davenport, Iowa. And the first time we visited Iowa when I was about six, he set up his drum set for me. But then when I tried to take a percussion course during summer before junior high school, the teacher converted me to a tuba player because he needed tubas in his marching band. But unfortunately, I went to his arch rival junior high school and ended up playing tuba for the other junior high school and then played tuba through junior high school, high school and one year of college. So you played uh, more than one instrument. Yes, tuba and all the percussion Very stuff. Talented author. Wow. Yeah, my, my, my lip isn't very good anymore, but uh, I'm not sure what I could do, but uh, we'll talk about that later. The tuba. Pardon? Why did you give up the tuba? I went back to percussion. So I, I, I did one year of marching band with tuba. And then in my fourth year, I went back and, and wanted to play in the percussion section. So they put me on the cymbals. So I did halftime shows that year playing big 19 inch crash cymbals. And uh, my physique was pretty good after that, although I've lost most of that since. <laughs> well, Rich, uh, when we started this, we said something about the, the, the video that's kind of gone around uh, that we, well, we all like it, but uh, we build it as uh, your video that you would send in as, as uh, your application to become a professional basketball player. Now, I think we all got to see that. And then you tell us about it. what is this all about? that the net was full of snow so the ball didn't come down. <laughs> the, the two points still them. counted, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's the truth. I, I was in the garage doing a little cleaning and I found this completely dead basketball. And I said, gee, what can I do with this dead basketball that's funny? So most people think the snow is stopping the ball from bouncing, but it's actually the dead basketball. And so I... I actually am a pretty fair basketball player. My, my wife actually played, uh, Chris, she played division one basketball with the University of Idaho, so she's better than me. Uh, but I can usually beat her by using my superior cheating skills. <laughs> so so I, I set the camera up. That was the first take. I, I, uh, I tried doing a couple more, they were not as good. And so that, that very first take with the cell phone was the winner. Well, it's a funny video, Rich, and we've all, all enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I love that video. Maybe I should send, I should send it into a America's Funniest Home Videos and see if I can win $100,000. You should. You, you, haven't you submitted to anybody? I haven't. Well, do that. Yeah, it may, it, you may get enough money to support your nasty habit of being an author. I know. <laughs> 
So you play like the rest of us. Let me tell you, I, that, that looked like an old home week for me. <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't play basketball um, with a team or anything, but I played a lot of sandlot basketball. And uh, in college, I would run down after Friday, classes were out and play basketball. So I don't think I was ever good enough to play in a team, but I did enjoy it. I don't think there's any other thing that will attract young men quicker than uh, somebody start bouncing a basketball. Yeah. You know, they'll come from any, everywhere. I don't know whether girls do that or not, but I know that just bounce a basketball out in the street and you'll have kids out, out, out of their houses. You didn't even know they lived there. Yeah. Okay, well, is there any other question, anyone that would like to... Uh, uh, Bring us up to date with Rich. Uh, anything that you've just been dying to hear about? Uh, that was very enjoyable because I only know you as a writer. I didn't know that you were a basketball star and a <laughs> star too. So, so it's very nice to know that that extra dimension of you. Yeah, I think that we've all uh, enjoyed uh, being here with you today, Rich, and to getting to know you. It's, it's, it's really nice to get to know authors and where they come from and that. Uh, but I suspect that you have not written your last book. No, I'm, I'm working on one right now. It's, it's uh, going to be a little different. Um, you asked me to write another book in the Western genre. And then my wife said, why don't you write uh, something uh, more like uh, the bridges of Madison County or one of those, you know, something like that. <laughs> and so I, I'm doing both. And so the, uh, I, I finished the first draft a few weeks ago and I'm going through the second run. So the, the book is about a fellow who marries a woman from Dunkirk, France. Uh, they move to Southern California. Uh, their marriage falls apart. And then he gets diagnosed with a brain tumor. He tries to get her to sign divorce papers on his hospital bed before he goes into surgery. She refuses. They put him under and he wakes up in a bed in a Western town and someone pounds on the door and, uh, and he answers it. And they said, Marshall, I've been looking all over for you. And it turns out he's the marshal of the town. So the first, first uh, quarter of the book is, is, uh, um, uh, something my wife wanted. And then the middle uh, 20 or so chapters are a Western dream. Uh, of course, with uh, it's a dream. It's a dream sequence under anesthesia. And so it has dream stuff in it. For example, the main character, uh, Thomas, who's the marshal, is terrified of horses, uh, Victoria. Yeah. Um, but uh, no problem. One of the characters from his first book uh, a U.S. Marine named Humphrey shows up in a Jeep to, ride, to drive him around so he doesn't have to ride horses because it's a dream. <laughs> and at one, at one point, they stop at the Seven Samurai gas station to gas up and get their oil change. Which is a reference to the Magnificent Seven. So it has stuff like that in it. And then after, after he, uh, the, the climax of the book, uh, well, then one more thing, his wife is the town doctor. And of course, the, he goes through an entire... Uh, interaction with her that's highly charged related to the fact that their marriage is falling apart. And when he wakes up, he has a different attitude. So <laughs> first quarter is what my wife wanted. Middle half is what you wanted, Evan. And then the last quarter goes back to what my wife wants. <laughs> It'll be interesting. I am amazed at authors, what they come up with. I just, I, I know so, so many authors and then they, they say, submit a book and I read it and I think, oh. How did they ever come up with this? I mean, here's Rich, the percussionist that plays basketball in the backyard with a deflated basketball and then writes stories about dreams and gunfights and all that kind of stuff. And and, and I look at uh, Marianne and Victoria and Steve, uh, the same. Uh, I wonder, uh, where do you guys come up with all this stuff? And then to put it down, in a way that it's interesting and entertaining and informative. I, I admire each of you for that. 
And uh, Rich, uh, I thank you for being here today. Uh, here's a picture of you, I guess, in your natural habitat. That is. That's uh, looking looking south down Gosneau Channel at the uh, Seawalk in Juneau, which was built a few years ago. You, you caught me using my model pose. I ran into a contractor once who told me that whenever someone takes a picture, I need to I need to look up to the left because it makes me look like a model. <laughs> hey, uh, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so what's this? That's out at uh, that's out of the uh, at an office. Here. That's right um, near near your home. It's about uh, fifteen miles. Mm -hmm. Drive out to the Mineral Glacier, park your car, and then it's about a two-mile walk. Now, did that can, glacier not, that's receded quite a ways, has it not? It's receded a lot, yeah. It's years years you've been there? there uh, but it's receded a lot. And they did have, every, every so often they have ice caves, and they had one this year. Um, we actually were about a week late, and so it was starting to thaw. We actually didn't even chance walking across the lake. Uh, but we did see it a couple of years ago. No, I didn't understand what you said, an ice oh, cave. They, they sometimes have ice, an ice cave out there by the glacier, depending on the uh, climate conditions for the year. And you have a cave that goes up inside of the glacier? Yeah, you, you walk out to the glacier. You walk across the lake uh, to the glacier and then over the side, around the sides of it. It actually can be fairly strenuous. And then and you can walk down the side of the glacier. And all no, of the authority. Can that. I can't do I won't do that. Well, all of the authorities will tell you not to do it because of liability, but people do it. There, there's always a risk that something could collapse, but pretty, pretty much everyone knows if it's safe or not. If it starts dripping, get out. <laughs> <laughs> and cracking and making noise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rich, it's been uh, fun being here with you today. And so we'll uh, just say uh, goodbye. Thank you for being here.